Greetings and welcome to Writers on Writing. I'm your host, Dr. Brenda Green, and this program is paid for by Maker Evers College. Writers on Writing comes to you each Sunday and gives you, our listening audience, an opportunity to hear writers from the African diaspora talk about their work, their lives, and their craft. And I'm very, very pleased to have with me to this evening the phenomenal Cherie Renee Thomas. Welcome, Cherie. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Green. Okay, I'm so pleased to have you. Uh, this has been um, a long time coming. We are very excited because we are honoring you at our National Black Writers Symposium, Biennial Symposium, which is celebrating Black writers. It's actually diasporic, diasporic visions a celebration of Black speculative fiction. And you embody that. So we're very, very pleased that we can honor you with the Octavia Butler Award. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a great honor. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to share with our audience some information about you. Cherie Renee Thomas is an award-winning fiction writer, poet, and editor. Her work is inspired by myth and folklore, natural science, and Mississippi Delta Conjurer. <laughs> Nine Bar Blues, Stories from an Ancient Future is her first all prose collection. And she's also the author of the novel, novel adaptation of the legendary comics, Black Panthers, Panthers Rage. That's relatively new, your novel, right? Yes. And she's the author of two multi-generation, multi-genre hybrid collections, Sleeping Under the Tree of Life which was long listed for the 2016 Otherwise Award. And she's also the editor of the groundbreaking Black, Black Speculative Fiction Anthologies, Dark Matter, from 2000 and 2004. You also are currently an editor. And we'll let, we're going to talk about that, of the, of the uh, fantasy journal. So we're going to talk about that. We'll hear more about what you're doing as we continue this conversation. But I'd like to start by finding out a little bit more about who Cherie Renee Thomas is, um, who she was before she began uh, writing and publishing and editing. So let's, why don't you talk about what mo motivated you first to go into book publishing? Because that's where you began. Yes. Um... I've been working in college at an independent black bookstore called Gallery 350 that was owned by Sandra Burke. And it was in downtown Memphis, um, about a block from where I live right now. Um, and it's um, around the corner from the National Civil Rights Museum now. And at the time, um, that was like one of the few black bookstores in the city. And it was a place where almost all of the writing community uh, would cut pass through those doors, right? And it was also an ga art gallery. So there were visual artists as well. And so it was just the space where I felt very comfortable and I felt very hopeful and very inspired um, being around all those wonderful black books and all those legacies. And um, a, a friend of mine, Jamie Hatley, who's also an amazingly talented, wonderful writer and uh, filmmaker, she was also working at that bookstore. And one day she came in with a copy of Black Enterprise magazine. And oh, yes, it was- I remember that. You remember that, yeah. It was a yes. publishing issue. It had all these amazing, wonderful people on the cover, including um, Cheryl Woodruff and, you know, the you know founder of One World Books with Christine yes. Noble and also Marie Dutton Brown. And it was just, you know, all these great women. And I had never thought about our presence in publishing beyond being writers, right? And she said, this is for you, I think. And I, I looked at it and I thought, wow, they're, they're publishing all these great books. And so just to fast forward, I'd been, I'd taken a class, a slavery literature class um, with um, a Milton scholar. And it was one of those classes where you don't get to take it very often because they don't get to teach it very often. Right. That was that was a long time ago. Slavery yes. and literature. Yes. Okay. yes, yes. And in that class, we studied Margaret Walker. 
We studied, um, you know, Jubilee. We studied uh, Shirley Ann Williams, Dessa Rose. Yes. Yes, we read um, Charles Johnson's satirical novel, Middle Passage. And we um, we we um, we read some of Mandingo and watched part of the film. <laughs> you did Mandingo also. Yes. Wow. So he he was giving you all perspectives. Yeah, she gave us, um, it was Dr. Vanessa Dickerson. She gave us um, a, quite a good overview. And we read Kindred by Octavia E. Butler. And I had been a, a science fiction fan in, um, when I was younger because my parents were, and we, you know, I grew up in North Memphis um, around wonderful oral storytellers, my grandparents, and also great readers. And, but when I went through adolescence, I wanted more representation in my work. And I didn't know that as a term at the time. I didn't know that's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. I just, that when I read some of the science fiction and horror, if I saw black characters at all, it wasn't very reflective of, the, of any black people I actually knew mm -hmm. or any of our sensibilities. And we didn't actually survive most of the time in those stories. Right. So I started really diving into black women's fiction and literature. It was discovering for the first time Octavia E. Butler's Kindred, which is what really opened my eyes to what could be possible in the speculative fiction genre. And what she was doing was just amazing to me. I'd never seen a Black woman character as a protagonist in a novel in that way. I'd never seen time travel used to explore African um, history, Black history at all. And it just seemed very progressive and very innovative to me at the time, and also very complex and controversial, right? So I went back and just started reading everything I could find on from Octavia Butler, and it really opened, expanded my idea of what science fiction could be. I knew that Samuel R. De, R. Delaney was um, a queer writer, but I didn't know that he was African American at the time. Right. No, he, he did not advertise that. <laughs> yeah, and I just, you know, I just when I read his work, I just never saw any photographs. Right. Of course, I find out later he's extremely handsome, <laughs> wonderful, erudite, you know, person, and that actually had taught um, Octavia Butler at Clarion, uh, which is a science fiction writer's um, uh, workshop, and where Octavia Butler started her writing career and sold her first short story. So, so we're, yeah, that's how, we're, I got, how it started for me. <laughs> right. But you were you reading actually science fiction earlier before you, oh, you yeah. were reading science fiction? Oh, so you were just reading yeah. it and not thinking about race and you're just reading science fiction. I was just reading science fiction. I was reading Gothic literature. I've been, um, um, a, you know, a big reader. My mom taught me to read very early. Um, so I went into school reading. I um, had been writing since I was a little kid just because I loved stories. Right. And I loved the stories that my family would tell. And I and they were also very kind to me. They would always listen to my little weird stories. Um, and so I just, that was just where I felt comfortable. Writing is right. something that you didn't need an audience for it to create it initially. Um, you didn't need a lot of equipment. I could write on the backs of envelopes. I could write on notepads. Right to write on anything and um and I can do it by myself you know yes uh, now now you are uh, you've been doing publishing you started actually in that world in publishing although you're a writer but you're also a writer and a poet so I'd like for you to talk a little bit about what got you into your writing and what are the themes you focus on in writing speculative fiction hmm um one of the big um, influences for me was, um, and continues to be, is the author, uh, writer, Arthur Flowers. Um, yes, yes. The most visible Black writer that we knew of at the time. And he was very generous. Arthur would come back home to Memphis. He would have free community workshops. Um, because a lot of times when the writers would come, they would be a part of the university. And if you weren't a part of the university community, um, and some of the campuses weren't as welcoming as others, then you weren't going to be, you weren't going to, one, know that the writers were there, and two, you wouldn't feel like you were welcome to be there, but Arthur wasn't mm -hmm. like that, and so um, being in his workshops, it's particularly um, the ones that he had in, 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 in New York, you know, when I moved to New York with the New Renaissance Writers Guild, you know, because he had been a part of the Harlem 
yes. writers guild with John Oliver Killens, who was his mentor. He continued that um, wonderful tradition of having intergenerational writing workshops where you have writers who, as we say, have you know wear multiple crowns. So yes. I was in classes with people who were playwrights and poets, quilters and photographers, you know, um, novelists and screenwriters, mm -hmm. um, people who wrote creative nonfiction and who were working on films. It wasn't a thing where one, you needed permission to write. We didn't have to, you didn't feel like you had to go through a series of, you know, of classes in order to be a creative writer, nor did you feel like you had to stay in one particular um, genre. You know, people would move genres depending on the story they were trying to tell, and it would take shape from there. So author was part of that. And so I was writing poetry before I, I left Memphis, um, reading far more widely when I got to New York, because then I'm hit with all these amazing bookstores. I was living in the Strand practically. <laughs> right. You came um, to Nkuru. <laughs> yes, I was in Nkuru in Brooklyn, even though I lived yes. in Harlem. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I was at Liberation um, Books. I was just everywhere, you know, wherever books right. were. You never know what you would find. And it was this amazing spot. Um, I also used to moonlight um, on the weekends working at Forbidden Planet, which is a science fiction bookstore. Yes. And I remember when they used to be right across the street from the Strand, there was a, a store, a kind of like secret, open secret above them, where this, this gentleman had like the entire African diaspora it's oh. upstairs in boxes on shelves. And you would just go in, pick the books or posters or broadsides or whatever he had, chat books. Oh, on it and give him a price, and he would. That's a secret. No, I yeah. didn't know about that. I yeah, he was that. always going out of business. Every time you went in, he said, "Up, oh, get what you can get." This is, I'm shutting down. I'm I'm throwing in the towel. Okay. And he didn't do it for a, at least a good decade, I think. <laughs> you 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 know, as you talk, I'm thinking about what's going on now in in publishing and writing, and what younger the younger generation are doing around the what I call the the hip hop culture. In terms of they, there are no really there are no boundaries among the kinds of writing that are that's being done. You know, people are moving back and forth. As you said, when you're in a workshop, you you can be involved in reading, screenwriting, and poetry, and fiction, and um, memoir. It's it's all of everyone coming together, and those elements are used in your writing, you know, that, you know, when I, when I read um, your writing, I think of, I think of jazz and I think of poetry. Oh. <laughs> and then of course there's prose because you have all those elements. And I see that's what people are doing. They're not sticking to specific structures around writing. And that's indicative of, of what's happening in our world and in our culture. And that's indicative of speculative fiction, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> We like to cross borders. I like to say just from the book publishing um, days that a lot of these genre titles are like real estate. It helps us move, you know, bodies of work around so that you can get them to the audience that may most want to read that work. And it helps booksellers sell the books, right? And it helps scholars have a space in which to talk about it. But you know very well as a scholar that a lot of times works um, have multiple identities and multiple levels and there are different ways that you can approach it and that's the way it is also when we create I think um I'm often thinking about the the the, the whole purpose of of writing right it's symbolism it's symbolism of ideals and things that we already think and feel right and it helps us make connections and for me the novel um the whole concept of a novel, it should be that each writer is creating a whole new novel ideal, a whole new novel story that can only be written from their particular point of view and from their particular lens on the world around them. And right. with speculative fiction, we just exp expand that, that lens to incorporate things that we don't necessarily agree that's part of reality, right? Your imagination is the boundary, is the limitation. Right. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into your projects. So so tell tell us about your novel and the other projects you're working on and you have recently worked on. Oh, okay. Um, 
Black Panther Panther's Rage was um, a wonderful, wonderful um, experience. It was a little nerve wracking uh, because I already know how um, comics community can be, the fandom. They're very, very protective of these um, wonderful legacies, right? And to be able to write in the you know Black Panther universe was um, quite an honor. I first um, wrote a novelette called Heart of a Panther for Jesse um, Holland, who edited the first um, Marvel anthology, uh, Black Panther Tales of Wakanda, which is stories, prose stories, not a graphic novel, not uh, mm -hmm. comics, um, for the Wakanda world and, and the Black Panther. And that was a lot of fun. And um, I was invited to write um, the novelization of Don McGregor and the legendary Billy Graham, who, you know, you know, just really, and Rich Buckler, those three really mapped out what we think of as the Black Panther. Yes. Um, like the boundaries of it. And of course there's Christopher Priest, who, you know, who innovated it even further in Reginald Hudlin. So I think those like between those five, you know, that was the space that I was really doing my research on, really reading and thinking about how do I bring the, um, the original story of Black Panther to a 21st century audience? And how do I bring the love story back into it, right? Um, it's the Marvel Cinematic Universe is very different from the comics. And, you know, there are some changes that are really great for the screen. But for those who are familiar with the stories, and those you know amazing pages and I think of the Panther's Rage graphic novel it's probably the first graphic novel that there was right it's important to bring Monica Lynn in um, because she was his you know T'Challa's love and he wanted to bring her home to Wakanda and you know and have a life of her after so much grief that he experienced you know from his father's murder but of course Killmonger secretly has major, major plans. And there's a little bit of that is shown in the first Black Panther movie, but I get to, I got to explore the entire um, battle for Wakanda between Killmonger and his many, many, many <laughs> of, um, villains that helped him um, try to take over the, the country. So that was, that was a lot of fun. I had a lot of research to do. There's so many great books in that world that are out now. Um, another project I worked on, of course, was The Memory Librarian yes. and um, other stories from Dirty Computer, which is Janelle Monae's fiction debut, her fiction collection. And I had the great honor of um, co-writing or collaborating with her on Timebox Altered um, in that collection with four of the amazing writers as well, Alaya Don Johnson and E. Ewing, which I know you're familiar with, and Danny Lore and um, Yohanka Delgado. So that was a lot of fun. And we got to go on a little mini tour. <laughs> okay. So yeah. you also um, participated last year in a conference at Carnegie Hall on Afrofuturism. Mm -hmm. It was a concert. I thought it was really, really interesting. Why don't you share that? Because I think that's kind of symbolic. It reminds me of the other direction that you see going in, in speculative fiction. You see the film, you see the television series, but to bring all of these artists together and to have a whole conference and lectures and tours, lectures and, and debates and music on Black speculative fiction, share, share with us what that experience was like. Mm, I was a co-curator for um, Carnegie's Hall's very first um, historic Afrofuturism citywide festival. And the thing that was exciting about it is that curating is like another form of collaboration, right? And I got to collaborate with some amazing people, um, including Yatasha Womack um, and Dr. Renato Anderson and Dr. Judy Lewis, Judy Sokai, and also, of course, the amazing King Brit, you know? So the way that we edit books, you know, I edit Dark Matter, I edited also Africa Risen, um, which is a new era of speculative fiction. Um, I co-edited that and the music part of it, it was it wasn't just the music, but it was also thinking about the community programming. All of that was tapping back into my, I feel like my my early uh, New York roots because um, before I even ever published Dark Matter, I'd already published a Nazi fiction of the African diaspora, which was a literary journey uh, journal I did. That's with, right. Yeah, with Angelie Raspberry and the late Martin Simmons. 
Um, and Martin was one of my teachers at the Frederick Douglass Creative Arts Center in Manhattan, which is one of the places that um, my first roommate in New York, Rhonda Penrice, the journalist, um, recommended that I go to an author flowers, you know, also recommended that I take, you know, writing classes there. So right. it's like going full circle with um, with that. And um, New York is such a big backdrop for a lot of Afrofuturism. Um, of course, you know, uh, Chip Delaney um, was born in New York and, 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 and a lot of other amazing people have roots and connections to the city. So it just seemed like a wonderful fitting place to have all of these um, musicians, uh, Sun Ra, you know. Yes, uh, Marshall Carol Allen, Saunders. Yeah, right? <laughs> yes. or, or Nicole Mitchell, uh, uh, Theo Croker, just this, all these great people, Fatima um, um, Diallo, just from around the world, it was fantastic. Um, and I love the community programs. Those were really great, you know, because we had film series, the, you know, dance performances, readings. We had an Afrofuturism hip hop cipher. Um, there were podcasts that you can still listen to um, from Carnegie Hall that each of the curators did. We uh, created our own playlist, you know, which gives you like a, a wonderful musical introduction to this very long tradition of music, you know including so many greats. So, right. yeah. So when you look at the trends right now in, in Black speculative fiction, and just kind of also to, uh, for our audience, just share Black speculative fiction, Afrofuturism, what's the connection there? Because it seems, and sometimes I see them used interchangeably, mm -hmm. but then sometimes I see Black speculative fiction as an umbrella with Afro, Afro uh, um, futurism within that umbrella. So how are you defining it? Um, people use it in different ways. Um, when I did Dark Matter, it was a century of speculative fiction from the African diaspora, right? I want to be very you know, specific and, and accurate. Speculative fiction is an, all, an umbrella term for science fiction, fantasy, horror, and the interstitial works that are not comfortably in those, those categories, right? It's fabulous work, right? And so that I used it in the way that Samuel Delaney and Marilyn Hacker used it for an anthology that they did. And I believe that Chip Delaney used it in the way that a Robin Heinlein originally conceived of it. And it's the ideal that social um, conventions and traditions and society may change and evolve over time. So it's not just looking at technology or looking at, you know, um, you know, the um, sciences, but it's looking at the way people and communities are ordered over time. So speculative fiction um, in that way. So it could include science fiction that's okay. off Earth, you know, off right. Earth and, and in space, but it also can include fantasy, it can include magic and it can include right. things as well. Okay, so really depends on the context. So when you look at the, the trends right now, how would you characterize them? I think Afrofuturism is still a very popular term. I've been watching a reemergence of it for the past, you know, 30 years, ever since Mark Derrick coined the term in the early 90s. Um, and Alundra Nelson, of course, expanded upon it with the scholarship that she was doing with the Afrofuturism.net listserv. Um, now I believe that we've expanded it to think about um, things outside of an American-centric point of view, because that was the origin, of course, looking right. at American music, looking at Black American dance culture and graffiti culture in the um, urban centers of the country, right? And seeing how they use science fictional ideals and themes and movements even, uh, robotic type movements, right? Um, to expand their art. And that's what Mark was thinking about um, when he interviewed Samuel Delaney and the late cultural critic Greg Tate and the scholar Trisha Rose to talk about these things. And fast forward, um, I would say the 2.0 is what Dr. Ronaldo Anderson, who taught for many years at Harris Stowe University in St. Louis and is now um, in the graduate department of you know, Temple University in okay. Philadelphia. It's an umbrella term for not just the science fiction literature, but the, the music, the visual art, the, um, the films, right? 
all the other forms of it. And it's not just American centric, it is global, right? So that's what the Black, Black Speculative Arts Movement is about. Um, thinking about how different communities of Black people around the world are exploring these themes in their context, in their communities, and with their aesthetics. Right now, um, there are conversations about African futurism. Um, and oh, you have yeah, African yes. futurism was um, first introduced um, in a journal called Paradoxa um, that was edited by Mark Bold. And she was looking at um, Pamela Sustrom, who's a visual artist um, born in, um, I believe she was might have been born in Kenya or has connection to Kenya and Uganda um, and is now in Canada. She was looking for a way to talk about the aesthetics of African visual arts and how these other themes that we've been talking about can apply to African art and how it has its own particular space. And then later the uh, writer, uh, Nadia Korifor was also thinking about this in her own work and began to think of her own way of describing the work that she was doing creatively. And so she looked at the tradition of Jujuism or magic and spirituality in Africa, as well as the technology, right? So she started looking at African futurism from those two um, perspectives. And so today there is a large community of, um, and I say large because we're moving from concept of zero, the way they, th they didn't think black writers were a part of the science fiction genre, right? Uh, for many years, they didn't think we read it or wrote it beyond Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney. Now there are African literary magazines that are dedicated to African science fiction and fantasy. Um, there are some of our best prize winners are coming yes. from, you know, from um, who are writing you know, African speculative fiction or African futurism. Um, that is a part of the world now. Um, and there are, are writers who are thinking about the concerns and, and the, the, the joys and the dreams and the aspirations of people on the continent of Africa, you know, which is very unique for all those different nations. And that's why I really am so excited about African Risen. Um, I co-edited it with Ogini Chowe, Donald Ekpeke, who is from Nigeria um, and has been doing some historic things himself um, as being one of the, the first um, African writers who live in Africa, not in the diaspora, not I in see. Ohio, not in Chicago, not in New York or in England or you know, Canada, but living right on the continent of Africa, who is contributing and writing and at a high level um, in the science fiction genre and, and winning awards. Um, and Zelda Knight, who's, who is also a writer and a small press publisher herself is the one who conceived their first anthology that they did, which was Dominion, which um, was a wonderful collection that I had a chance to review for Asimov's. Well, so, well, well believe it or not, we're almost at a close. So as we come to a close, I want to congratulate you again and ask you to share with our listening audience, um, what message do you have for aspiring speculative fiction writers? Oh, um, read widely. I always tell any writer, whatever your genre, to read as much as you can in the field so that you get a sense of what the conventions are and what, where that you can, you know, where you can innovate on them and, and do something different. Um, and so that you can understand, you know, what readers are looking at right now. And also to read it, not only first as a reader for enjoyment, but then read it as a writer with a critical eye to think about how certain work hits you, how does it strike you and what do they do? What are the techniques and the craft that they use to help you think about things in the way that you did or feel something when you were reading those particular things. And then to just write long enough so to the, until you yourself have a voice, until you have discovered your own voice, and always, always, always put your full self in your writing. Um, don't flatten it down to try to accommodate the industry because the industry is always changing. And um, if you're trying to write for this one thing, guess what? They've moved on 10 steps ahead anyway. So just be yourself the whole time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give us your website. Oh, you can find me at shereenethomas.com. 
on Twitter at Black Pot Mojo and on um, the gram and on Facebook, Cherie Renee Thomas. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Cherie, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you for enlightening us thank and you. sharing with us the work that you're doing. And um, I want to the audience to remember that the writer's always reading, the reader's always writing, keep reading and writing, empower yourselves as readers and writers. This radio show was paid for by Megar Evers College. And you can also watch us on YouTube. Visit centerforblackliterature.org, www.centerforblackliterature.org. And you'll have an opportunity to see Cherie Renee Thomas in person at our upcoming Diasporic Visions, a celebration of Black speculative fiction, March 31st through April 1st. Thank you. This is Dr. Brenda Green signing off.